to Beyond GDP. The organizers of today's event that you can see on your screen in a few minutes included the subtitle Reimagining Economics for Our Common Home because our times are calling us to do things differently. If countries have any chance to manage their way through the facing crisis of climate change, poverty and inequality, racism and social unrest, then things have to change. Like Einstein said, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. Climate change presents the largest economic and social challenge society has ever faced. Can we imagine a different path? One that will help us manage climate change? One that will help us weather the storm? Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the, that I'm in Kingston, Ontario, and I'm grateful to live um, as an uninvited guest upon the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Anishinaabe Nation. To acknowledge this traditional territory is to recognize its longer history, one predating the establishment of the earliest European colonies. It is also to acknowledge this territory's significance for the indigenous people who live and continue to live here. People whose practices and spiritualities were tied to the land and continue to develop in relationship to the territory and its other inhabitants that live here today. The Kingston Indigenous community continues to reflect the area's Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee roots. There's also a significant Métis community and there are First Peoples from other nations across Turtle Islands here today in Kingston. I invite you to acknowledge the traditional lands where you are joining us here from today. You can do so by clicking the chat button at the bottom of your screen and, uh, and typing in the, uh, the territory where you're joining us from today and, and others can join you in acknowledging that your territory. We will be using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen throughout uh, the question period near the end of the presentation. Um, but if you think of questions along the presentation when you hear uh, um, Dr. Marilyn Waring, feel free to write your questions in earlier and, uh, and we may be able to get to them, uh, refer to them later. Now I would like to introduce uh, my coworker, Mark Hathaway, who will introduce our guest, our special guest. Thanks. Hello to all of you. My name is Mark Hathaway, and I am the Executive Director of the Jesuit Forum for Social Faith and Justice. And I'm speaking to you from Toronto, where I also uh, teach at the University of Toronto as a sessional lecturer. It's my very great pleasure today to introduce Dr. Marilyn Waring. I first came across Marilyn's work uh, through the NFB film, Who's Counting, many years ago. And in that film, she exposes the pitfalls of gross domestic product or GDP, a measure that marginalizes the significant economic contributions of women, of nature, and of many living on the margins of our societies. Uh, at the same time, the film demonstrates how the pursuit of growth as measured by GDP exacerbates inequality and accelerates ecological destruction. Dr. Waring is a former politician, an author, academic, and feminist activist for human rights and ecological sustainability and justice. She is a professor at the Institute for Public Policy at Auckland University of Technology in New Zealand, and she's perhaps best known for her 1988 book, If Women Count It, but she's offered a She's really authored a wide variety of books and a few of them are showing up on, on the slide that you can see right there. And there's also a, a link to her website where you can find out more about that. Uh, Marilyn is a key founder of the discipline of feminist economics and her work has influenced academics, governments and policies at the United Nations. Marilyn. Thank you so, so much for being with us today. We're so honored to have you. Welcome, and uh, we look forward to hearing what you have to say with us. Kia ora. 
Kia ora tato. Uh, good evening, everybody from Aotearoa, New Zealand, and thank you very much for this invitation to be with you. I'm going to spend a little bit of time uh, just backgrounding key pieces of information, which some of you may be already familiar with, so please just be patient for those who aren't. It's going to sound a little bit um, governmental at the beginning, uh, but after that, we'll be free from those kinds of things. When I was a young politician in New Zealand, uh, I could never understand why the things that my constituents valued the most um, were never part of any policy making frameworks simply because they didn't have market values or they weren't traded in the market. I started to ask questions about what kind of system delivered this to us and initially I had no comprehension that there were a set of rules that were internationally imposed on all countries. Uh, these originated in a document called the United Nations System of National Accounts. And it is the system of national accounts that creates the framework for gross domestic product or GDP. Now, sometimes the way people talk about GDP, you'd think it had been here for thousands of years, but it was invented in 1953. And the first edition of the rules in 1953 made some things really clear. These accounts were going to measure all the things that passed through the market whether or not those activities were legal or illegal. It was only going to count the environment when various environmental resources were traded, marketed. So you can see that deforestation was going to be good for national accounting frameworks. Uh, overfishing was always going to be good the national accounting frameworks, uh, mining uh, and mineral extraction, they were all going to, to count as growth in GDP, but leaving resources in the ground, leaving our forests, uh, leaving our fish for sustainable reproduction, had no place in the data that governments used to determine their key policies. The other key thing that was left out of the framework was all unpaid work. Now, initially, that included, you've got to keep, when you're from Canada and New Zealand, we do have to keep reminding ourselves of the much broader, wider scope of activities that are in or out of the accounting framework. So all subsistence production, which in particular included all subsistence agricultural production, uh, was left out of the framework. And in particular, all work that happened in the household the household was seen only as a unit of consumption. And one of the things that the past year has taught us is that the COVID epidemic has completely undermined this particular rule in our accounting framework because really significant amounts of production and manufacturing and service work transferred to our households as we locked down and began working from home. 
The accounting framework is revised from time to time. So there was a revision in 1968, and the main change there was to specifically include a number of fields of subsistence production, mainly the thing that things that men did unpaid. So making furniture, for example, or um, shoes, making footwear was included. The, the thing that has now happened with this construction of the accounting framework is that the nature of the globalized market means that independent nation states find it extremely difficult to understand where some transactions take place. Um, particularly, this is in with respect to financial transactions. So the last revision of the accounting framework rules was in 2008, and it's already a long way behind. It's simply, even given its very narrow perspective, it can't keep up um, with the natures of the changes in market transactions. So over the years, the things that we have found have been that using time use studies, we've been able to demonstrate that the largest sector of the economy is in fact the one that is left out um, as being unpaid work. Uh, that unpaid work sometimes is called care work by Western feminists, um, but a great deal more unpaid work happens by, let's take any rural woman on the African continent, and many of them in South Asia, who do far more than keep a household and care for the people in it as unpaid work. Um, in the Pacific, of course, we have um, significant communal subsistence work in fisheries, in gardens, uh, and in forestry. The, the treatment of the environment has not changed since 1953, and the GDP scenario has been one of the principal um, causes of environmental devastation and of climate change. When the basic principle is, if you destroy it, mine it, deplete it, it counts. And if you leave it there, it doesn't. Um, obviously, that system is not assisting us. The, there has been, I want to say, a really significant and um, well-directed group of exercises in Canada over time to look for alternatives to GDP. When I was writing If Women Counted, I used the Canadian census to demonstrate what was and wasn't counted in terms of work, not because I thought it was poor, but because I thought it was the best in the world. And so if I could isolate problems there, then they would be um, able to be seen very clearly in terms of the, the very best place. One of the things that I'm sure you've noticed, and I certainly have, is that as governments, uh, um, those of us who are lucky enough to live in places like New Zealand, Australia, Taiwan, where we are actively planning for recovery from COVID, is that all of our leaders simply resort to the growth paradigm. We're gonna grow our way out of this, they say. So there's been very little imagination given by our elected leaders to the opportunity that COVID has offered us to turn in another direction. Um, I've been aware over the years 
of alternatives to GDP um, being produced in Canada. Uh, in Nova Scotia, Ron Coleman many years ago led, uh, when the cod fisheries was closed, led uh, a really significant piece of research, Genuine Progress Indicators, GPI, Atlantic. To this day, it's hard to find better narration, and I'm saying better narration, of the trade-offs that are um, in, incurred when we um, mess with our oldest forests, when we're trying to work out how to keep mangrove swamps from despoilation. Uh, the narratives that were written in GBI, GPI Nova Scotia, I still think can teach us a lot. There was work done by Mark Anielski or led by Mark Anielski in Nunavut. And there are some really lovely, memorable moments in that work. So that wealth is not how many dog teams do we have, but it is how many of us can share a dog team. Mark, I know, also worked with the Indigenous peoples of British Columbia um, in respect of forestry proposals uh, in northern BC. And just in the recent responses to COVID, I've noted several really important moments. One is the um, book by Demeter Press, which will be published very soon. It's called Mothers, Mothering and COVID-19, Dispatches from the Pandemic. And it draws on stories from uh, women from at least 70 countries. Um, and it's important for us to understand how COVID has been used in a number of places as an opportunity to impose significant restrictions on human rights. Um, so I like the voices that contribute to that. I've also just been looking at um, the YWCA led work um, with the Institute of Gender and the Economy at the Rotman School of Management. And uh, so you can look at the Feminist Economy Plan for Canada. Uh, and that might also be of interest and of assistance to a number of you. In a more international situation, so-called responses or alternatives to gross domestic product have been led by the Organization of uh, Economic and Cultural Development, the OECD, um, which is headquartered in Paris. Uh, they have um, heard the resistance to continuing to use GDP as a central pivot and uh, try to propose <laughs> some alternatives. And uh, they just stuck in the same old paradigm as GDP. They're completely monocultural. Um, they have some really bizarre ideas about how to measure safety and um, a very, very narrow frame of those environmental indicators that they have any concern for. So I really believe that our responses this time um, are from communities because there is so much difference between us all that these international manifestations of rules simply do not work. Um, and I was very pleased to hear that, you know, there were local political representatives 
going to join us today. Um, in Aotearoa, in New Zealand, the very best wellbeing indicator sets have been built by local authorities, by regional councils. We don't even try to pretend that the same indicators have the same relevance just throughout this small country with its very different climatic zones, its very different population bases. Uh, so I can see in the questions that are coming up that we're going to be able to really get down to some uh, less abstract and some highly textured discussions. And I'm very delighted to be here to share this with you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marilyn, uh, for really laying out uh, how much has been done uh, by you and others over the years to return us to uh, a knowledge of what you know we already know uh, in terms of what matters, in terms of prosperity, in terms of care, in terms of what keeps society going, uh, which is something that we've all been just, I think, really uh, obviously reminded of over the over the past year with the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, uh, introducing myself to everyone, hello, I'm Jeremy Malloy. I'm one of tonight's organizers, and I'm also the lead of Integrity of Creation and Climate Change with the JPIC Office of the Sisters of Providence. And I'm here to help move us into the Q&A portion of the evening. So as Marilyn suggested, uh, we have uh, questions that were prepared in advance uh, by our panel. And um, then we are bringing the question and answer period to the broader uh, group that we have here tonight. So if you have questions for Dr. Waring, as Bridget mentioned earlier, please share them using the Q&A function on our Zoom call. Uh, don't use the chat, please. Please use the Q&A function. Um, so as I said, we've got a few questions from the panel that we've prepared uh, for Marilyn in advance, and then we will move on to uh, your questions after our break. So our first uh, question comes from Stephen Sharper. Stephen, please go ahead. Thank you. Hi, Marilyn. Thank you so much for your uh, work, the presentation, and all the commitments that underlie it. It's deeply appreciated. Um, I teach environmental studies at the University of Toronto and am now heading up a new initiative, the Integrated Sustainability Initiative at Trinity College within the University of Toronto. And my question centers around these large environmental threats. So climate change, biodiversity loss, and related ecological threats, as you know, endanger the health and indeed the continued existence of countless species, including ourselves, the human family. How does the focus on economic growth and GDP drive ecological destruction? And how might an economics based on other goals and measures help humans to live more sustainably and perhaps even more regeneratively with the wider earth community? Well, thank you very much for that, Stephen. I noted that your, part of your framing of your question was how could economics help us? And I don't think it can with respect to this, that we have to, economics can be a player, right? But it can't hold the central position. Um, it's kind of colonized as much as it can all of life since 1953, either commodified it or determined that it was of no value. Um, I have a place in the room for the current GDP, but it is no more important than all the other data I need to be in the room. And one of the things that I think I I talk about in the Canadian film uh, is this sense that um, economics is, because economics gives us per capita GDP, 
that that is somehow or other the most important determining uh, quantitative exercise that we undertake to see how the well-being of a community is going. But it's not. It does not tell us that at all. Generally, with respect to the environmental considerations you're talking about, GDP assists to make those worse. It encourages heating of the planet. It encourages climate change. So with respect to environmental indicators, um, I believe we can't, we have to move away from a single figure as if that's the only judgment. A lot of politicians like the fact that you just have a unidimensional dimensional measurement because they don't have to think very much. They just have to see is GDP up or down and then make budgetary decisions annually to resource the things that they think will increase that GDP figure again. What we have to expect of our politicians is that they can make judgments across a variety of indicators. It's what, frankly, you and I do every day. It's definitely what those of us, you know, who are preparing food do every day. We make judgments across the various dietary requirements of the people in our households. We make judgments across resource use. We make judgments across purchasing uh, and storage and a whole range of other things. We don't just have a unidimensional grab that TV dinner and shove it in the microwave kind of approach to life. Um, so I'm a very big advocate of everything that we know about the environment being on the table, everything measured in terms of its own integrity. So for example, um, polluted air measured by the suspension in the air models that we have. Um, deforestation measured both by how much is lost and how much of it was old forest. Uh, and how much of it is contributing to helping the planet to um, breathe, and to pr producing oxygen, etc. cetera. Um, going from, to, to seize what, to everything we know, and then something that I was so happy, our own Ministry for the Environment in New Zealand did last year, Every several years, they are required to write a report on the state of the environment. So the last one, in the first place, really front and centre incorporated Māori values. But secondly, each time that there was something we needed to be worried about, where we did not have rigorous measurement, or we did not have time period measurement and had only just started. Nonetheless, if we had no numbers, the narration was still there. It was to say, you must make judgments, including this. It cannot be left out simply because as yet, we don't have a rigorous and transparent way to demonstrate how we're measuring it. So that to me is really vital. I would move right away from GDP um, in thinking about how we all need to approach uh, the real challenges in the environment. And that whenever city, provincial, uh, federal governments are making decisions, that material is on the table. They have to deal with it in that way that they cannot abstract it to some kind of economic number or framework. Um, and you know what happens with abstraction is that you start to leave people out of the debate and out of the argument. And economists love that. 
you know, they love, they just in their little silo and they're the wise men generally. Uh, and they're all chatting to themselves and the rest of us don't understand. So we're not even invited into the arena. I think that the more material that we can force into this debate to be on the table, in terms of characteristics we know and understand, the better. It's a much healthier space for democracy if we proceed in that way. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you, Stephen, for that question. Uh, next up for questions is actually me. So hi, Marilyn. Um, uh, I, so I mentioned uh, the work I do with the Sisters on Environmental Work, um, but I'm also a historian of, of working people and work itself. And, and before that, uh, I was a service worker, you know, mostly in restaurants, uh, hospitality. And so when one of the things I really connect with about your work is, is your understanding of how a lot of care work and a lot of service work is, is really undervalued. I, I like what you just said about abstraction um, because a lot, I think, of, of people who do that kind of work are, uh, and in, in other sectors as well, are treated as abstractions, right? Uh, and you know the, that's one of the sinister things is, is if you can uh, treat people like that uh, on paper, it follows that it's easy to create policies that, that fail to appreciate uh, you know, the real human needs of, of people who are, uh, you know, living their lives primarily before their economic function. Uh, you know, here, for example, one of the big issues that we're dealing with provincially is um, uh, the pandemic exposing the fact that we don't have sick days provincially, right, um, which is, you know, probably looks great on paper, but is, is, is not optimal uh, often for people trying to do work in a pandemic. So that leads me to my question. Uh, you know, these economic metrics fail to appreciate the value of care work, and that's, you know, intersectionally um, doubled by the fact that that work is most often done by working class people and specifically uh, low wage female and racialized people. So could you please elaborate on this phenomenon, uh, you know, GDP's devaluation of care work in the context of the current pandemic, which has both underlined the essential nature of this work and also the increased the safety and economic burdens that uh, are bore by those people who are performing it? That's a big question. <laughs> Uh, okay, so before we moved, before we had COVID, we had, in terms of time use, this single largest economy uh, that was unpaid work. Generally in the household, but you know, Māori have taught us, we do a lot of unpaid work with respect to our environment, many of us. Um, uh, are doing that, whether it's in our own fields and gardens or whether it's in helping to clean up rubbish or um, belonging to advocacy groups who are working in that area. That's all unpaid work as well. Um, the book that Demeter Press are just publishing began from of Facebook posts of how single parents with small children were supposed to do the grocery shopping when only one member of the household was supposed to be the person who went and stood in line. And how it was for this woman who could not leave the young children at home and needed to take them. Um, gathering the abuse of many of the other people standing in the queue uh, because of what she was doing. The, the lockdown has exacerbated uh, the amount of work that goes on in a household, particularly um, when many of the services that were supplied outside had to be brought back. Now, one of the things that we've always known about unpaid service work is that the poorer households take longer to do it. They don't have the electronic assets, uh, you know, that are available, all the dishwashers and the, you know, self-driven vacuum cleaners and many of the other things. Um, it all takes longer and it takes more time when you're poor and it definitely takes more time in the winter. 
Um, in the system of national accounts, um, it was made very clear that unpaid household work, and it specifically differentiated what that is, the preparation of meals, the care of people in the households, um, shopping for the household, which is generally uh, one of the only spheres of unpaid work where men uh, appear at a relatively parallel time with women, and the only time when men seem to outdo women in unpaid uh, work in the household is in transportation of members of the household or their goods. Um, but nonetheless, men and children uh, all participate in this unpaid economy. And when we measure it in terms of time taken, it is overwhelmingly the largest sector of our economy. And I often think to myself, you know, I wonder how it would be if a treasurer or a finance minister rocked up with the budget and said something like, in a New Zealand context, oh, yeah, 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 we know agriculture is the, bigger, the biggest sector, but we're just going to do a budget this year without counting it. Um, that's the impact, frankly, of what is going on. You cannot make good policy for people that you cannot see. And the current structure only makes those people visible, one, if they're a producer, or two, if they're called welfare, if somehow or other they are now dependent on the state, despite the fact that they're doing the key work that enables the entire market to continue. Now, one thing I don't think people recognize is that when those authors of the systems of national accounts were challenged in that their particular rules did not align with those of the International Labour Organization, the ILO, or with the census of agricultures in different nations. They changed the rules. So the rules now are that you only have to be paid in paid employment for one hour a week to count as employed. I don't know what people think they're reading when they read employment figures, but certainly under the last US regime, when they were uh, crying out about the increases in, um, in employment that are going on, I'm always sitting there whenever I hear these kinds of figures going, oh yeah, yeah, and, and how many hours a week were any of them working now? Because I think just about everybody listening will know, understand that employment figures are pretty far-fetched and of not a great deal of use if they're counting everybody who works at least one hour paid per week and obviously all the other things as well. What we've also found, um, and this was really highlighted and exacerbated by the pandemic, was that so many of those people who are in the lowest paid jobs, um, that many of them have been stereotypical jobs such as cleaning. And uh, when we went into the pandemic, some of the most crucial, critical people who remained in employment in New Zealand anyway, um, were cleaners. Um, whether that was of airports, police stations, hospitals, a whole variety of other places. We've had for some time a real push here on pay equity. And overwhelmingly, those female-dominated services, social workers, nurses, preschool teachers, cleaners, care workers, especially in elder care, have been the people who have been the subject of the research to get them pay equity. 
At the same time, our unions here um, have been very active around a living wage. And in small ways, for example, in my university, it was very useful for those of us employed here to be able to advocate in that kind of micro context that we expected not just everybody employed by our university, but everybody contracted by our university to be paid a living wage. And one of the things that is very important to me is that when we're feeling really overwhelmed at a macro level about what can we do to change things, that we're constantly finding at a micro level things that we can be engaged in and advocating for to make change, however small it might be. And that gives us all the energy to keep going, um, being engaged in that kind of advocacy. Um, I also think that um, <clears throat> um, you've picked up something else that is obvious in New Zealand. And one of our human rights commissioners has just begun a year long investigation into the wage rates and uh, industry areas of employment of Pacific Island peoples in New Zealand. Um, there is a real difference in the rates. Uh, we can see that really clearly in the public service. Um, that has been highlighted very quickly. Um, but I'm really delighted that the Human Rights Commission is now taking this on. Um, we know it, that this commissioner herself was in fact employed at a very high level in the Ministry of Social Development um, with a significant salary difference between herself and other senior social workers. So this is being brought home now. Um, and I think possibly it's time to lobby some of the human rights commissions in Canada to look at what is happening in racialized employment. I'm sure that um, there as well, particularly in the care industry, there are significant numbers of migrant peoples who have held that together right through COVID. Thank you. That was um, an incredibly informative and engaging and rich answer. I, I, I could, I wish I could ask you about a million follow-up questions <laughs> on some of the things you went through. Uh, I, I really appreciated um, some of the storytelling that you did as part of your answer. I think that's so important um, to, to tell the stories of individual people that count with that abstraction uh, that you mentioned and, and, and the focus on, uh, you know, individual things, uh, you know, tangible things that we can do um, while working towards a bigger vision. Um, our next uh, question is coming from Victoria Blanco. So Victoria, please go ahead. Hi, I'm Victoria. I am the program manager for the Jesuit Forum, um, where for the last year we have been working on a project um, to create space for dialogue uh, with Indigenous peoples um, based on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's call uh, for just and right relationships. And, and through this process, we've seen it as, as our responsibility um, of both settlers and newcomers um, living on the land and, and people who have benefited from the legacy of colonization um, and the land taken from indigenous peoples. It was our obligation um, as treaty peoples to, to uh, contribute to this dialogue um, in the hopes of, of creating better relationships. So with that in mind, my question is, um, is related to that. Uh, both New Zealand and Canada uh, are places marked by the ongoing injustices of settler colonialism and racism. How does, the, how does a focus on economic growth and increasing GDP reinforce 
and reflect the values of colonialism? What is the relationship between struggles for indigenous rights and sovereignty, as well as against racism, and the struggle for an economic economy focused on human and ecological well-being? Um, thank you very much for that question, Victoria. I consider myself extraordinarily lucky, and I hope that Canadians do too, that people with generations of great wisdom can teach us really significant other ways of being for the well being of all of us. When I'm engaged uh, in conversations um, with uh, New Zealanders who uh, are demonstrating racist attitudes, um, I gen my, my general first stop is to move to one sixth of New Zealand's land mass, which is locked in national park. And it's locked in national parks because the indigenous people of New Zealand, the Māori, gave their land to the government to be preserved for all, for all time. Uh, that, to me, just speaks volumes. In, I'm, I'm, I can remember a couple of years ago actually watching television in Toronto and weeping as finally the First Nations people's case that had taken 20 years, I think, to go to the Supreme Court was finally settled. And I was listening to the elders talking about that journey and the people who were lost on that journey and what it might mean. Most of the, the values that Māori teach us um, come in the Māori language, but the treaty settlement process in New Zealand has given the opportunity for iwi, that is, for different tribes um, who do not all share exactly the same approaches to these things, to be able to create special treasures of some of our natural features. And I'm just going to um, quickly open a piece um, from my book still counting. And at this point, I'm railing about even the term natural capital, which seems to me an extraordinary contradiction in terms. I loathe the word capital um, when it is used with respect to social capital or environmental capital. Um, so, or in this case, natural capital, um, which is the word that uh, the OECD is using in their well-being. And in New Zealand, a river called the Whanganui River and uh, an extraordinary mountain, Te Maunga, uh, um, Taranaki and a really major park area called Te Uruwera. In the treaty settlements, those features were all granted the status of legal personality. So that if you do harm to them, it is seen as being harm to the tribe. Uh, and so I was drawing on that in pushing back at our um, treasury's use of natural capital. 
So just quickly, I'll read this. When it comes to natural capital, Treasury wants to know more about its quantity, state and nature, so as to identify its financial value. But in this monocultural framework, what will be the treatment of Te Awa Whanganui, Te Maonga Taranaki and Te Uruera, all of which have been granted the status of legal personality, and if anyone harms or abuses these iconic features, it is the same as harming the tribe. Then there are our national parks established to quote the relevant legislation for the purpose of preserving in perpetuity their intrinsic worth, containing scenery of such distinctive quality, ecological features or natural systems so beautiful, unique or scientifically important that their preservation is in the national interest. They comprise 30% of our land mass. An area equivalent to a further national park is contained in the protected covenants under the Queen Elizabeth II National Trust. This is nobody's capital. So for me, the future of um, our protection from the destructive forces of GDP has meant that the movement on treaty claims by indigenous Maori people is in fact at the forefront of protecting all of us from forms of ecological devastation. I see it as my job in the past, when I was a young politician 40 years ago, it was my job to get my foot in the door and my shoulder against it and to push very hard to make room for the wisdom of the Māori coming behind me. I don't have to hold that door anymore. Our partners are there and they're teaching all of us what we must do. Thank you so much for that. Um, I think similar things are have happened in Canada and are happening and we um, have a responsibility to, to listen and, and to follow uh, the wisdom of Indigenous peoples because as you've mentioned, they are fighting for, for all of us. Um, and with that, uh, I think we're ready for the next question. Thank you so much. Thanks, Victoria and Marilyn. Uh, yeah, so we have, uh, just to get us all on the same page, we have one more question from our panel. Uh, following uh, that, uh, we will be taking a five minute break and then reconvening so that uh, the wider audience's uh, questions can be taken up. So if you want to ask a question to Marilyn and you have not yet put it in the Q&A, now or during the break is a really excellent time to do that uh, so that Barca and myself during the break can help uh, get those questions uh, to Marilyn. So our final question from the panel is from Sabrina Di Matteo. Sabrina, please go ahead. Thank you, Jeremy. Quay, Marilyn, uh, my name is Sabrina Di Matteo. I am in Montreal and I work for the Canadian Religious Conference. Um, this national network established in 1954 brings together the leaders of about 240 Catholic congregations of women and men religious in Canada. Through their lives of prayer, service to those at the margins and advocacy at regional, national and international levels, religious communities witness to an alternative way of life and the hope for a more just world. So here is my question on the behalf of the CRC. Religious communities in Canada have been working together to advocate for a just recovery from the pandemic, including long-term secure green jobs, justice for women and racialized communities, and respect for Indigenous rights. Now, with so much widespread structural, institutional, and societal change currently happening, we see this as a critical moment to act, and we are proposing a document called Principles for a Just Recovery, which is based on values seeking human dignity and the common good. Marilyn, what are your thoughts on the movements that are forming all around the world for a just recovery um, or a just transition? Thank you. 
Um, I'm very hopeful. I have often said that um, those who like the current um, system because it suits them so much really like us to believe it's all too big and we can't do anything. So for people to be mobilized across so many planes, um, and I think for me to be active in neighborhoods, communities where they understand what is needed. I mean, it's going to be the response in Nova Scotia is going to be different from the response in the Yukon, right? Uh, and so we're not looking for the great national fix or even the great planetary fix at this point. It's what we can do right here that speaks to our location, our people, um, our, again, what we can learn through our history, what matters. I'm thinking of, uh, I wish I could remember the small uh, place, but when GPI Atlantic were doing their um, research, and so according to all of their indicators, they worked out what they thought was the poorest town in the area. And when they went there to tell this to the citizens, the citizens were outraged. <laughs> Nobody, you know, they had lots of, of subsistence food gathering that was going on all the time. Nobody missed a meal. Nobody went hungry. What did they mean? They were the poorest people. Um, and and that even in that context, trying to impose, you know, a series of indicators, et cetera, was not right. The best wisdom for how to overcome um, situations is invariably in the grassroots of those who have been subject to the vicissitudes of, of a particular period or a particular history. Um, one of the things that I'm really hoping we can get moving again are the needs for time use studies. Canada had them at one stage. It doesn't do it very well <laughs> now. But one of the beautiful things about time use studies is we've all got the same amount of it. Like you can't pop off and buy more than 60 minutes in an hour. Actually, you can buy services for it, but in terms of yourself. Um, and there's absolutely no reason why 12 year olds upwards can't participate in this. And it can give you really wonderful breakdowns of different age-related needs, uh, gender-related needs, ethnic-related needs. Um, so again, you're not homogenizing everybody and presuming that they all have the, the same amounts um, of interest in particular policy responses. One of the key things for me in watching the COVID has been watching women moving from double time to triple time in terms of the work that they've been undertaking in their homes. And yes, uh, lots more dads have been baking, uh, but I'm always interested when they get as far as cleaning the bathrooms. So, uh, you know, <laughs> any mobilization in the cause of social justice. Um, any mobilization that doesn't obfuscate or invisibilize a whole lot of people all over again. Um, we do have to work coming out of this pandemic from the place of the most vulnerable. You know, it's all that old, those old cliches we were told when we were growing up, you know, the chain is only as strong as the weakest link. Um, uh, nobody is free 
you know, unless everybody is free. And that means freedom for me, freedom from all kinds of fear. Um, one of the, the silent epidemic that uh, the YWCA principles speak about that has been exacerbated under the COVID lockdown is violence in the home. So we need to be giving voice to the things a lot of people don't want to talk about as well and not leaving those off the agenda or putting them in the too hard basket. So this epidemic of violence in the home has been around my entire life. Uh, and it's the silent epidemic now lying underneath the COVID epidemic. So really some really major turning points being made in that field are vitally important. Um, and yeah, just, um, I think really scanning that the kinds of advocacy that we're involved in is not just about us. And for me, that's hugely important as well. Um, where are others calling out for our help? We don't have to be the leaders. Where can we put the energy? That to me is really vital as well. Thank you very much. I think that absolutely resonates with um, the preferential option for the poor that is uh, uh, in our in, in in the spirit of the work that the religious communities do. Jeremy, back to you. Thanks, Sabrina. Thank you, Marilyn, uh, for all of your answers to the panel's questions, which were really wide ranging and, and engaging and, and fascinating. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, we're going to take five minutes. Um, if you have no, if you have a question. For Marilyn, that you have not yet put in the Q and A box, please do so. Otherwise, you know, take a minute to stretch or get a glass of water or whatever. And we will be back at six thirty-seven when Monica Lampton will lead us through uh, our next Q and A. Thanks, everyone.
Hi, everybody. Welcome back. I hope you had a, a good five minute stretch. We have just over 20 minutes left in our time together, and we're going to spend the bulk of that on the questions that are coming from you. And we've received quite a few questions. And what we've done, Marilyn, is clustered them into a couple of themes. And so the first theme that we're seeing is around economic system change. So a lot of people are asking, how do we rethink the goals of our, our economic systems and related measurement in order to achieve sustainability? We see there's other options, but how do we get there? How do we start rethinking it, convincing other people that we need to rethink it? And some of the um, particip participants have asked specific questions, for example, about the gift economy, sacred economics, these kinds of ideas. How can we bring that into real concrete mainstream rather than this abstract stuff that you've been um, um, talking about that's happening today? Okay. Uh, first of all, I had been speaking, I think, um, with, with respect to Stephen's first question about uh, not commodifying everything to make it fit into the GDP um, mix. So as a kind of interim step and as a former policymaker, when I think to myself, what would have to be on the table for me to make decisions, for me to redistribute resources, for me to work out where um, the investments should be for the well-being of the population. At the moment, as a New Zealander, the things that I would want on the table would be our environmental data, not commodified. I would want a really decent time use survey. Um, I want to see where time pressures fall, especially in the unpaid work sector, and where those interventions are most needed. So particularly in homes where somebody is uh, responsible for 24-7 care of someone else uh, or others in that household. Um, you know, doing that seven days a week is not great for your well-being without intervention. So I want to know where the time traps are. Uh, I, do want to know um, what the GDP figures say, but I remember during our break some work that was done, oh, quite a long time ago uh, by Cobb, Clifford Cobb, uh, and he was looking at an index of sustain sustainable economic welfare. So he, he took the GDP figures and he kind of broke them into goods and bads and regrettables. So um, I noticed that, that somebody on the um, chat had asked about, can we get rid of illegal activities from the GDP figures? Well, no, we probably can't um, because when... Uh, people are deforesting um, teak illegally in Malaysia, you're unlikely to know by the time it arrives as your teak furniture whether or not there were illegal activities along the way. However, simply deforesting the teak should sh shift it into the beds <laughs> um, column, if you see what I mean. So you would have your... Um, agriculture or forestry or manufacturing data in front of you um, and you would make some fairly heroic assumptions about what was for good and what was for bad and what was regrettable but you would start to have a picture of the reality 
of what production means. So I'd have that sitting in another part of my table. And then in New Zealand, I would also bring on to my table the real key principles of Māori well-being. Um, a word like whanangatanga, which has at the root of it family, extended family, community, health of that community, of everybody. Um, it's a really different sense from individual human rights. A lot of time, I'm not really comfortable, I love human rights, right? But a lot of the time, I'm really uncomfortable if it's only about individuals as opposed to being about peoples. Um, and, or another word like kaitiakitanga. So kai is food. Kaitiakitanga is about the well-being of this whole ecosystem, this whole environment that we live in. So for me, I'm not about trying to plug unpaid work into the current GDP situation. I'm not about trying to plug faith-based community volunteer work into that GDP system, right? That work's going to appear in our time use data. Um, I'm about putting all the things we know, the best we can gather, unobstructed, on the table, for us all to be engaged in the conversation about what our priorities are. We have to disempower the, centri the, the central feature of GDP to, to understand how narrow its focus is in the world. What a poor database it is for anybody to be making key resource and governmental decisions and to be pushing back with this other material that we know about that makes no sense in terms of the whole GDP abstraction. And, you know, as I said earlier, using this other data means many, many more of us are engaged in the conversation. Now, Obviously, the people who love GDP don't want us to unpack it this way because it really suits them. But, you know, at the key of it, it's about a redistribution of power. The getting beyond GDP has to be a major redistribution of power, and that means redistributing the power of that economic symbol itself. And one of the ways of redistributing the power is to uh, assemble the other data which it cannot cope with. So that is not the, the great rainbow horizon beyond altogether. But for me, right now, we could do this tomorrow in New Zealand with the political will. That's where I'm about going next. That's great, thank you so much for that. It leads us into the next cluster of questions, which is around government responsibility. So we can see that there are some challenges to this and we had a number of questions coming in asking things like, how can we expect governments at any level to do this if they're in a four year um, time slot system? You know, How can we um, get over that burden of asking them to make this huge shift when they're really concerned about what they can achieve in a shorter period of time. There was also questions asking about um, what level of government, um, what different levels of government can do around making this shift. And then another question saying, is there any particular country that is doing well on challenging the GDP framework? Okay, um, <laughs> well, the problem with governments then is just a lack of imagination, truly. I mean, even in Canada, most of what I was just talking about 
and I want to really, Afi, I want to really support and celebrate um, how so many people listening have come in um, to the web chat, describing whose lens they're on and where they're from. Um, most people in Canada would have access to regional GDP data, regional environmental data, old, but nonetheless showing useful patterns of time use data, and Indigenous First Nations peoples who will have value sets around well-being that they can bring to the table for guidance. So um, it is fear of having to make decisions across a range of indicators that paralyzes governments. It is fear that they will not want to, trans if this is individually elected members, they will not want to transparently um, make decisions across a range of indicators because they're too scared um, or they can't be bothered or, you know, just getting the old GDP up is all they're really interested in. Um, besides, they will now be being lobbied by the powers that be who gain all the redistributed resources because they do create a growth industry will be mortified to think that resources might actually be redistributed to the people who did the most work as opposed to the people who did the most production. There's a difference. Um, so, uh, and I think if you belong to a local council, it's where you start. I really do. You just start asking the really challenging questions. But you say, but where is such and such, you know? So where have you got climate change needs reflected in this particular budget? You know, it's our responsibility to, what are we doing about it? Um, and for those of us who don't want to stand for elected office, then it's our job to be um, provide the providers. One of the things that I've noticed with a lot of um, advocacy, I do think uh, environmental advocacy is changing in this now, but that it always seems much easier to attack the people who are getting it wrong as opposed to doing the homework to provide the good folk with the things they need to proceed along the avenues they're pursuing. You know, doing the homework takes much longer than making the attack. So um, the more of us that, you know, you see a good person somewhere being elected to this particular office and you think to yourself, I'm not going to go and give them my 340 page PhD thesis because it will solve all their problems. It is about saying to them, look, I'm, I'm a student at a university. I've got access to web of knowledge, which you don't have in your little political office. When you have, you have a little challenging question, why don't you send it to me? And I will try and find what the very latest on that is in the whole world, evidence-based, clinically reviewed data. I would love to help you. This is a little something I can do. You know, thinking more along those ways. I don't know about your bureaucracy, but in the New Zealand bureaucracy, they certainly don't pay for all of our Wellington bureaucrats to have access to web of knowledge. They, unless it's on Google or unless it's free, they, they cannot access the latest peer-reviewed data across, you know, just about any subject that you can think of. So we, we need to think about that um, as well uh, and, and create, um, just create new ways. Uh, the, 
the Canadian Index of Wellbeing, um, which is, I've forgotten the name of the university, where it's located, but I know that they have done work for municipalities, right? So there are patterns available, Canada. There are people who have really been looking at this and really working on it. And obviously, politicians who supported that kind of, of work. So it's like, use the ones that are there, who are really understand, who are really working on this. Then you use your elected members. You know, you use your elected opposition members. Uh, you, you begin to be the best supplier to them of the tricky questions in the house with the backup data for them as well. Um, you can see an obvious change is coming in an election. You start working with the likely winners. You know, you what, what, whatever, wherever you can do it. Look, at a really, really simple level, I say to people, if you need to be in touch with a member of parliament, hand write a letter. They haven't had one for a hundred years. They'll notice it. They'll read it. That's great. Thank you so much, Marilyn. This brings us to the end of our uh, Q&A. And um, you've given us a lot of food for thought there. And I especially appreciated how you showed um, what some of the uh, limitations of government officials and politicians are, and then what some concrete things that we can do to, um, to overcome that and make a difference. So I'm going to send it over to Bridget now to um, move us um, to the close. The most spoken words in 2020 are, you're on mute, <laughs> and I just did it. Um, thank you very much for your, your presentation, your, your answers. Uh, I've been scribing lots by hand uh, and learning lots from you. So the conclu concluding question um, that we have put together as a team is, what might be some alternative to the GDP? You have mentioned quite a few today, um, but which particular ones would you suggest that um, we advocate for and promote uh, to for a better measurement for the well-being of the country and that, that will lead to a safer and a more sustainable climate and a more balanced society in terms of health, social equity and inclusion? Well, I think that Canada has um, really good environmental work. Um, so the, the one that is missing at the moment is time use. It's really an imperative time use. Uh, and we, that's a, a real key. I'm trying to think of a couple of things that I haven't spoken about uh, that I think are important. Um, I do think we all need to speak much more about a universal basic income. Uh, in New Zealand, we have a, a universal superannuation that pays a living wage to every person aged over 65 in New Zealand. So I argue that we already have uh, a universal basic income for 700,000 people. And we've learned plenty from that. And we should just look at expanding um, that. And one of the things that we do know from that are that some people stay in full-time work, some break down their work, especially women. We get a huge increase in volunteer and community work from those um, that particular cohort. Uh, and we get a significant number who are retraining or doing the kinds of um, craft and um, landscaping and things that they've always wanted to do and never been able to do before. Um, and I don't understand um, where regionally 
um, different parts of Canada are up to with Indigenous peoples. But to stand aside and learn from their well-being principles and environmental principles that they have used for thousands of years uh, on that beautiful land and that beautiful country. And that is not um, to think that we can take those and somehow or other um, scrunch them into our databases. They need to stand alone. They are um, extraordinarily valuable principles for us all to hold onto as we try to make these transformations. Thank you so much, Marilyn, for that. Um, as we conclude this webinar, we first off would like to express our deep gratitude to Marilyn for all that she shared with us today. It's been wonderful to hear your insights about GDP, economic growth, a just recovery for all, and so many other themes. And I think it really brings home how economics is really about values and what we count also says a lot about what we value and what we're not valuing. And uh, if we want a, an economy of care, or an economy that, that looks after people and the earth, we need to really reflect those values in the way we measure things, but in our economic goals as well. I'd also like to thank today, uh, both Stephen Sharper and Sabrina Di Matteo for contributing questions, our co-sponsoring organizations who help to promote the event. And of course, we thank all of you who have been present today uh, paying attention, listening, and sharing your questions. This is just the first, really, in a series of events entitled From Crisis to Care, Reimagining Economics for Our Common Home. If we are to create an economy that works and values all people and that protects, it seeks to protect and regenerate the entire Earth community, we really need to keep on questioning uh, our fundamental assumptions about what economics is, what what is valuable, including those around growth and GDP and create alternatives for the future. This series is intended to deepen our explorations and inform our actions and advocacy for a just and regenerative transition. Uh, for now, we'd like to share with you just uh, a few resources actually from the organization that I work with, the Jesuit Forum for Social Faith and Justice that might help uh, some of you to explore some of these themes in greater depth using kind of a dialogical uh, sharing circle process. Uh, we have a new resource that's going to be coming out in May. You can see there the cover of it, Listening to Indigenous Voices. And uh, it's really aimed at a very broad audience. This one is not, it, it, you know, certainly it could be used in a faith community, but it can be used in secondary schools. It can be used in workplaces, it can be, used in, in unions that can be used, you know, there are classroom pieces for it. And it really includes writings and reflections from some really key indigenous thinkers here on Turtle Island that help us to explore indigenous worldviews, the past history of colonization, and also concrete pathways toward right relationships, decolonization, and re-indigenization. And I think these themes, as, as Marilyn's been pointing out, this is a really important part about rethinking our economy and its values and that learning from the traditional peoples of this land and learning from those values and trying to put those into practice. And also just the whole work of really building relationships. Uh, there'll be a link in the, uh, in the uh, chat, which gives you a link if anyone's interested in ordering some of these resources, how you can do that. The second set of resources that are already available uh, from the Jesuit Forum one um, more aimed at faith communities is around the Papal Encyclical Laudato Si on care for our common home uh, that really helps think about those values. And this other one, Living with Limits, Living Well, um, once again, more broadly based, but I think it really has to do once again with, with thinking of economics beyond kind of uh, an aim on growth, but for living well or what in Latin America, Sansa Sumat Kalsai, but also those same concepts exist in so many different uh, indigenous traditions. So once again, if you're interested in those, you can uh, follow that link to order those. 
As we continue this series, we'll consider different perspectives, including uh, in an upcoming webinar, we want to look at Indigenous insights on economics. And we'll also be looking at some conc other concrete alternatives for the future. We hope you can join us again as we continue this exploration. We'll be following up with each of you to invite you to these future events. And uh, when we send out, for instance, the video from this one as well, we'll, be, we'll give you some information how to do that. For now though, we're going to close today's uh, event once again with deep gratitude to Marilyn and to all the people who have shared their wisdom with us. So uh, we hope to see you again soon in another uh, upcoming event. Thanks Marilyn. <laughs>